Before we get into today's show, I wanted to thank you so much for being a listener of our podcast, The CTO Studio. We wanted to invite you to come to San Diego, October 25 and 26. We're going to grab a whole bunch of CTOs from around the world to spend time together. Two jam-packed days, leadership, technology, innovation. We have a special surprise for you. Coupon code for the CTO Studio listeners. The coupon code is the CTO Studio. Just go to our conference website, 0111conf.com, and get your tickets, and we'll see you soon. Please come, say hi, bye. Hey, welcome to the CTO Studio this week. We have an incredible thinker, thoughtful person, someone who's going to challenge everything you know about collaboration as a software engineering team. Woody Zool is up next. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Woody Zool, welcome to the CTO studio. Thank you. This was a long planned way in advance event. Yeah, I think that's like three hours ago we <laughs> talked, right? So here we are. Cool. And I gave you two time slots, 12 or six, and you picked 12. Yeah. What does that say about you? That's twice as good as six. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So as I was telling you, um, CTO Studio is about uh, having conversations that generally I think CTOs would be interested in. Doesn't mean that CTOs get to chat with each other because I think that's a little self-indulgent, but talking to people like yourself who are, you know, just on the forefront of thinking differently about collaborating and bringing out sort of efficacy and productivity and overall happiness in the software development process. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Did, but that's a good thing. Did you like it? Yeah, good work. I good feel work. like every time I introduce you, I'm trying to come up with a phrase that will please you. Oh, really? Well, you don't need to please me. Um, yeah, but you know, that's the space that I'm, that I'm in, I guess. So I don't want to call you an agile coach or a consultant or a or you don't want me to call you the father of the illegitimate father of mob programming. Uh, how do you like to, how do you introduce yourself to people? Well, I, I think the biggest thing or the, the thing that I'm most interested in is making it easy for us to work well together. So that covers a wide range of things. Uh, there's some things that I've specifically done and hopefully we'll cover a few of those. Um, it's important to me that we're always questioning the things that we do without questioning the things that we have deep belief in we tend to not question yes so that that's what i'm interested in how do you introduce that you kind of get lulled into complacency and and i love that even the traits of agile which to so many uh tech leaders and developers is sort of like this untouchable document to just keep on questioning you know the manifesto and why and how and how does it still apply right yeah and and matter of fact that's a, a brilliant place to start because the Agile Manifesto for me has done a really good job of saying, here's some things that are important to us as we, as we explore better ways to, to create software or to manage the creation of software or to go about doing that work. Um, I don't think it was ever meant to be, here's the be all, end all, or some kind of a Ten Commandments kind of a list. It was just four things that we, we've discovered are important. And so, uh, and the folks that put that together, I think they understood that collaboration is massively important. And we can't collaborate on things if we're not working on them at the same time. We can't collaborate on things when we're working on different things. And we can't collaborate on things if uh, we're not near enough uh, time wise, but in space. And nowadays, of course, we have, uh, we have virtual ways of working together. But in those days, it was pretty much clear that we can't really collaborate when we separate people that should be working together. We say we're collaborating. We put teams together, but they're teams in often teams in, in name only. And uh, they're often divided up by kind of arbitrary or odd uh, divisions, like this is the database team, or that's the front end team. And you know, in software development, um, a team could be made up of, of 
any number of people or any number of skills that would benefit from working well together. How, uh, how much time do we waste when we collaborate? Oh, well, that's a good question. That's, <laughs> it's sort of, yeah, so that's the, uh, I would ask the opposite question, uh, which is, uh, how much time are we wasting when we separate people that should be collaborating? And in fact, that's, that's kind of primary to me, is we make an assumption that separating people and then coordinating their, their uh, communication and their, their, the type of collaboration we can get as being beneficial to us. But what is the advantage to it? Normally, I'll hear something like this. Uh, when, we, when we have five people working on five separate things, then we're getting five separate things done. But in reality, we have five separate things that are crawling towards being done. And when we bring those people together to work on one thing at a time, we all of a sudden are getting things done really rapidly. And in a, I would consider a more... Uh, a more beneficial way. We're getting feedback sooner. We have five or six sets of eyes on all the code. Uh, we're sharing our ideas in real time. We're coming to better decisions and we're able to unmake decisions. That's a big problem with decision making is that if we have to get people's sign offs and approvals on decisions, when we go, hey, wait, this isn't such a good idea, mm. we have to go and convince them we were wrong in the first place. Mm. Is that a good idea? I think that uh, when we collaborate, we get past a lot of those things. Is the juxtaposition that you're either spending time on uh, people collaborating or on people integrating? Yeah, well, that's a good point. So if, we're, if we are integrating at certain points, then when we do that, we're going to find out where we differ. And now we have to have the discussions anyways. Why did you think it should be done that way? What about this way? And we often, have, by that time, let's say it's a week or two later, by that time, we've forgotten why we made so many decisions, because we made them in tiny steps as we went. So I think the, uh, um, the greatest concern when you have a large, large-ish, and by large I mean maybe four or five people uh, in the same time and space working on the same problem, is that one or two of them are not, as, are not contributing or as efficient as they would have been had they been knocking out code by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea of efficiency is probably the, the place to start here. Is being efficient actually useful to us? Um, there's other considerations. Being effective is what I'm after. In between those is might, might be the idea of productive. Efficiency itself means, to some degree, that we've found a a way to do something with as little motion waste as possible, so to speak. So if we have a if we have, let's say we have a manufacturing device that's going to, uh, to, to screw two parts together, put two parts together, and, and it has to reach over quite a distance to pick up the one part, to bring it over to put it onto the other part. Well, if we have the parts really close together, then we've, we've gotten rid of some of the inefficiencies of it. But uh, we can be extremely busy without ever actually finishing any work. And so productive kind of has the idea that we're actually producing something. There's going to be an end result. But productivity really is just about um, the, the outputs uh, divided by the input, so to speak. How much are we getting done for the, for the time involved or whatever? Effectiveness is that we're going to figure out what's the right thing to be working on. There's an old saying, I don't know where it originates, but uh, I'd rather be working slowly on the right thing than really quickly on the wrong thing. But the problem is, what is the right thing? So there's part, part of being effective is a this process of discovery. How are we going to learn what is the right thing to be working on? I kind of like to think that, uh, that we have to have a combination of being efficient and effective, but really the important thing to me is being effective. And the way that manifests, just so that uh, we can help people who don't know what, what on earth we're talking about, <laughs> is uh, and the way that manifests and, and the thing you're passionate about is this thing called more programming. Um, which is the concept, and I don't want to get into it too much. I uh, just want to just quickly say it's, it's the concept of um, more than two, you know, less than X, I suppose, uh, software developers working in the same time and space, rotating a keyboard in sort of the driver navigator model with a big screen, and everyone's looking at the same code and, and, and building the same piece of software. Yeah. So, so the basic concept 
is that that if we are working on the same thing at the same time and in the same space, then we can collaborate continuously throughout the whole process. We're continuously integrating our ideas and our implementation of it. We can make decisions quickly and undo those decisions quickly as we learn things. Uh, I would take it a big step further, perhaps, because the, the outside thing, and I think I mentioned this already, the outside thing is that we, we really need to learn to work well together and to be able to do that. So with mob programming, and I want to make it clear that, um, that any technique you can use for doing this is not the important thing. The important thing is let's figure out ways to work well together. So the things that uh, we're doing have the possibility of, of having an extremely good effect. But we're going to learn that as we go. It's very hard ahead of time to plan those things. So we bring those people together for a meeting, and then they discuss what they want to do, then assign the different parts of it to different individuals, and then they go off and do it. We are getting out of alignment almost immediately. We, we've come together to get aligned, and then when we go off alone, we're getting unaligned. After uh, two or three days, if we work separately for two or three days, we have to come back together again and start seeing what did we find mm. and so on. It, uh, how does this, how is this, Different to pair programming? It's essentially the same idea as pair programming. Um, but so there's a couple things. Uh, rather than a technique, what's really important to me is having a way to know that we are communicating well with each other. And the first thing that I learned, which was a pair programming technique uh, from a friend of mine, Llewellyn Falco, was this idea that for, for a concept, for an idea to go from somebody's head into the computer, we want it to go through someone else's hands. That requires that we communicate well. And we have to learn communication is way more than somebody expressing their idea. It's a round trip. It's a, it's a, we, we need to have time to express ourselves. So we have to be good at allowing other people to express themselves. And then we have to have a good way to kind of try it, analyze it, um, and turn it around quickly so th that we get real data on doing it. And you're saying if it happens, regardless of technique, those are the values you're promoting. So the idea that, that if, if for, for, for an idea to go from someone's head into the computer, it has to go through someone else's hands, whatever technique we use, if it's a driver navigators, if it's, uh, which is uh, basically uh, one person's at the keyboard at any one time, of course, but uh, if we're rotating who's at the keyboard uh, based on any number of you know, concepts that we could use, Whatever that is, I'm fine with that. We used a timer in, in our original implementation. I still like to do it that way. Not everybody should be forced to take the keyboard. So the idea is whoever most appropriate to express the idea is doing that, and whoever feels appropriate to take the keyboard can do that. Uh, there's lots of techniques that we can use for this. And so uh, the rotating by a timer is just one way. Great. Um so you, uh, you're traveling around the world quite a bit, um, hosting um, workshops, right? Yeah. Are those mostly across companies, or are companies inviting you in to help them get started with MOB? Yeah, I think mostly it's uh, me going into firms to do internal workshops. A yeah. And is it a, a workshop where it's a, just a, let's explore this, or are these companies that are, are already convinced they need to do this, but they need help in executing? Yeah, it's probably some of both. Um, it's also you. So, that, so first of all, there are a lot of people out there who are already working this way. We've been talking about it since uh, um, 2012, I think. Uh, we started doing this in 2011, and uh, by August or so of 2012, we started speaking about it publicly because people were asking about it. So there have been, pe been people doing it now for five or six years, and at a number of places. I would say uh, my most recent workshop, uh, public workshop, there were some folks from a very large uh, company in Germany uh, with programmers and offices all over the world who specifically sent people to this little public workshop to see what it is and bring it back and start experimenting with it. So I, I would say, though, more commonly, I, uh, rather than the public workshops, I'm doing it internal. And this is, uh, there's two or three motivations. One is we've started exploring it. We want to get we want to get up to speed faster. Another one is we would just love to see something out of the ordinary to kind of spark our interest and, and help us think about things. Uh, but another one has been people have been trying it maybe for a year or two already, and they're just they're excited about doing it, and they want to get more. 
So uh, I would say I learn as much out of those as they learn from me because anybody who's doing it a year or two will have learned a lot. I love I love how uh, your emphasis on communication. So uh, it's almost like the training that now happens is actually sort of a life skill that gets taught, which is the ability to be aware and present during communication to, to navigate sort of the awkwardness all the way through to the over-enthusiasm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good insight. Uh, one important thing is that we, we tend to not listen well. Uh, in general, people tend to not listen well. And a lot of the advice about listening um, may or may not be really useful. Uh, these are things we need to be uh, building our skills in, me included. I want to be really clear. I'm not a great listener. I never really have been. It's just become clear to me over a number of years that that's a problem for me. I need to be good at doing You are this. a great texter, though. Thank you. Yeah, I do love texting. Yeah, yeah. So something like... Uh, you know, I won't mention any brand names, but it rhymes with jitter. Um, I, like, um, I like to use that kind of a, an yeah, environment, yeah. but I'm really bad at making points in it. I just, uh, it's great to just get an introduction to it. What idea. do you think of the open source tools like Slack, well, open source, the, the, the communication tools um, where someone says, well, we can be in the same space at our own computers and we just slack in a channel when we need to and have to, Well, as an objection to mob. So I would, well, first of all, there are a thousand right ways to do anything. And if what our goal is, is to better communicate with each other, I'm open for any path to doing that. The problems that come in with this is uh, if we're not scrutinizing how well something's working for us, we tend to use tools and use um, our thinking based on our biases and prejudices. And uh, so once we get kind of hooked on something because it, it, it works well for us for certain things, we look for reasons to tell others why we want it so it's more convincing. So it's, we're protecting this little space we've made for ourselves. And I'm not going to knock anything uh, that people use to communicate better, but let's just explore some of that. For example, if you and I are working on something that's related to each other, and you're at your desk or cubicle, and I'm at mine, or we're in different cities even, and I see a message coming in from you, then I have to, first of all, it could be a distraction to what I'm doing at the moment. And now I need to make a decision. Is, that, is it important for me to even note that I got that message? And if I do, then what is that doing to my thought process? You know, there's a, it's really hard to... Uh, to know when our best ideas are going to come to us. And, but one thing that is important is this concept of flow, where we, where we get into this state where we are actually, our brain is working at a very high-powered high manner. And if we can do that and then something interrupts us, we may drop out of the flow. And so this is the idea of context switching that we're all aware of. And if I get that message, is this going to take my attention away from where it is right now? to describe it for myself as a programmer, because many years I programmed, uh, when an idea is forming in my head, uh, and I haven't solidified it yet, all it takes is a simple interruption for that to evaporate. Now, other people may not have that problem. And I've got ways to work with it. I start taking notes. Every 15 or 20 seconds, I add to my note so that if I do get interrupted, I can get back on it. But this context switching mm -hmm. is a problem of working on two different things at the same time. If I see your note come in, and I decide to respond to it, I'm now going to have a context switch. And now I have to get into your context before I can give you a reasonable answer. So if you're, let's just say your question was about, uh, you know, there's three or four different ways to do this particular thing. I'm trying to figure out the best one. Can you help me decide this? Well, then I have to put my thinking cap on for that. And to get into your space completely will be almost impossible. I'll only be able to deal with the amount of information you've given me. So we may start having a conversation. We might even pick up the phone, but let's say it goes back and forth in Slack for a while. Now, of course, there I mentioned Slack, so I should have said Twitter earlier. So please forgive me for that. Um, you getting the picture here is we are now moving into someone else's context, but mm. it's never going to be very full. What if we had been both working on the same on the thing yeah. at the same time from the beginning? To be in that collective flow. We're in a collective flow. As a matter of fact, there's studies that are being done on that, and I think both of these kinds of flows are important. The flow that comes from being completely focused as an individual 
on something that's fully engaging us. We're fully concentrating on it. The rewards are intrinsic. All the things that they use to describe flow or being in the zone. Those things also can happen at a team level. And I believe that when we get good at that, we can take advantage of both. That we still are in control of our own thought patterns and we start learning how to think well with others. Mm. And if we go off at any moment, if we decide we want to think about something alone, there's nothing causing us to stay. We can just say, hey, I'm going to check out for a few minutes, go over here and think alone, or let's take it a big step further. Often, we can't force our ideas anyways. When we're working as a team, batting ideas back and forth, we do tend to, to spark each other quite nicely. But even still, we can't force our brains to come up with a solution. And the writings of Graham Wallace from about 100 years ago, he talked about stages of thinking. And the first straight stage is preparation. We're getting information about the problem we're trying to solve and thinking about possible solutions. When we're in that space, we can do a certain type of thinking. But the second stage or second phase that he describes is called uh, incubation. This is when we're doing something other than the direct thinking on this thing. We could be walking, uh, watching a play with our family or something on TV. Back in his days, they didn't have TVs. So going out to something, uh, perhaps uh, playing a sport or uh, listening clean, to music. Clean, cleaning out the chicken coop. Cleaning out the chicken coop, which is something they used to frequently do, apparently. Let's hope. And so you get the idea is that, that good thinking doesn't happen always when we're focused on the thing we're thinking on. So after that incubation period, at some point, five minutes, 10 minutes, five hours, 10 hours later, a month later, uh, we have this thing called an illumination. All of a sudden, uh, we get the idea and we, mm. everybody's had this experience. I haven't yet talked to somebody who says, oh yeah, I've had that. Out All of a sudden, the idea, out of yes. the blue. Yeah. And and meanwhile, meanwhile, what was happening was the prep, the incubation, and then that, that, that illumination. Yeah. So if we say, you know, I've often had, you know, managers or bosses say, look, we got to stay until we've got this problem solved. They may be doing the one thing that will keep them from getting the problem solved. Uh, I ask this question often in my workshops, when do your best ideas come to, to you? And the most frequent answer I get is in the shower. And another really frequent one is while taking a walk. And another one is just before I fall asleep or just after I wake up or in the middle of the night. And there are others as well. Well, so let's think more about how do we get our good ideas. I've never yet once seen it in a company where the boss comes in and says, we really need to get a solution for this. Everybody go take a shower, you know? And so th th this is, Chris, I, I need to be a little humorous with that. But one thing I've tried to institute when I've been working with teams is uh, let's have regular walks. You, if you feel you want to go walk alone, do it. You get the blood flowing. It gets more oxygen maybe through your body. It's... It's something that could be good for us. But is it possible, um, uh, so I love that, uh, is it possible that you may have team members, it seems like uh, that type of collaboration introduces this very inefficient medium, which is the, the mouth. Translating the thought to the mouth, to someone's ear, to someone's brain and understanding down to the keys. Certainly. Can one eliminate all of that by just going from the brain to your own hands and your own keyboard? Well, so the basic idea with mob programming is the person at the keyboard is acting as a smart input device. I hate using that term. I don't think of them as being a device, but they're, they're allowing the rest of the team to stay in the same cognitive space as the problem and the solution. And they're kind of separating off the cognitive space of the translating that into code. So, uh, yeah. So the first thing I would say is that speaking is only one way of this communication. So getting something to the computer requires at least most people to use a keyboard. You can also dictate. But most people prefer to use a keyboard. And so what do we do with that? You know, it's like that's just part of it. So everybody learns to type really well and learns shortcuts and all these things. But on the other hand, if we're going to keep an idea amongst a group of people, the code is probably the worst place to put it. So the code is going to be the end result of these communications. And as someone like Jack Reeves would have said, uh, you know, the code itself is the design document of our software, or at least to a degree it is. And so we need other mechanisms as well, which I think is things like the whiteboard or flip charts or post-it notes or uh, three by five cards or whatever. 
where we are also capturing our ideas in a visual medium, in something we can easily move around. Uh, it can always be done into a computer as well, but when we're working as a team and standing around a physical board and using moving physical things, we have stuff we can point at. This is related, and I'm not a scientist, but this is related, I think, to how people have communicated for ages. And the, the modern ways of communicating, using emails and so on, are something we're not yet very good at. So uh, emphasizing the fact that uh, just because you're going to be sitting together at a keyboard writing code together, that it doesn't negate the need for the planning sessions, the, the whiteboard sessions, the, you, know, all the, you know, all that. Well, those things, are, I would hope, would be done uh, in really rapid little cycles. As a, as a mob. As the team. As so, team. If, so if we're now, again, there's nothing saying that this is like the only way you would work. Of course. You know, you would be sitting together sometimes, and you could also, people could split off and work alone. If you feel, right now I'm overwhelmed by all this, I'm going to go be alone for a while, you can do that. Uh, if somebody feels like not taking the keyboard, that's okay. But the basics of mob programming is we're going to bring together all the skills and knowledge that we need to get this work done. So everybody's there for a purpose, and if we all stay in the same context, when it's the right time for any one individual to contribute something, then they contribute it. Does this work really well when someone is on the team, but let's say the code is in, in JavaScript, and uh, you have a team member who, who doesn't know JavaScript, which I think is you know, not a great example, because most people do, but someone's not a JavaScript ninja, but they might be more in C or C++. Um, are, have you found in your journeys that those can be as effective teammates then if, if the code is in a certain stack? or Yeah, the, uh, you're, you're revealing a kind of a, a, something that's bigger that we need to talk about. The individuals on the team, would, I would hope, are spread across all the skills we need. So when we think about this, I believe, in a reasonable way, that means that not everybody's going to be contributing at their full capability during this whole time. And that's what I think bothers a lot of people about the effectiveness of this or the efficiency of it. But in reality, we're, we're organizing for the flow of the work rather than the output of the individuals. This is an important, you know, lean concept that if we optimize for the individuals, then we're going to pay a very high cost for coordination and collaboration or, or communication. And if we don't optimize for the individual, we, we instead optimize for the flow of the work, then th what we seem to be losing in, in the f busyness, uh, we far make up for in the quality of the output. And I don't mean because, merely because it's bug-free, but I mean we're working on the right thing, we're doing the we're working on it in, the, in a better manner so the outcome is going to be stronger. We're going to make better decisions, and we're not going to be afraid of unmaking those decisions. I mean, I see, I see uh, just this, this utopia of junior engineers learning from seniors in the same team, product design people sitting with back-end systems people doing the same thing. Uh, is, is that truly what happens? That's the basic idea. So if we've gathered together all the knowledge we need to do this work, the, adva the big advantage is that, that we, the work can flow directly from start to finish without any waiting or excess inventory. Now, inventory is anything we've started on but, but haven't finished that isn't yet delivering value to the end user. And if, that's, uh, if we, every time we introduce inventory, we are introducing waste. It's one of the wastes in, the lean, in lean thinking. But waiting is a huge waste. As a matter of fact, uh, people like uh, Reinertsen, who has the book, um, you know, uh, Product Development Flow, talks about a queuing is a huge problem in product development. I don't know what kind of numbers he's got, but uh, he, he certainly says something like 95% of the waste is queuing or waiting. And I see that uh, also with inventory. That when we've, what we often do to solve this is... If, if we can't get our, uh, we're blocked on getting something done because we can't get an answer right now, then we work on something else till we get the answer. And, and we spend a lot of time trying to get the answer. But anyways, once we have it, we can get back to work on that other thing, set the thing aside that we started on while we are waiting for the answer. 
Well, this is introducing inventory. So we now have two problems. We have this queuing problem. We're waiting for the answer. And we also have this, uh, this inventory problem. We've started on something, and now we have two things to keep our brains occupied. And our brain can only, well, I, I don't know. I'm not a brain scientist. You know, I can hardly, uh, you know, I'm not an academic or anything. I don't do research. I'm just saying there's only so much we can do before we've overloaded ourselves with things to think about. And I believe that if we could take something from beginning to end, it's an advantage. So we, um, we've known each other for a while, and we've, we've talked a little bit about something that's been brewing in your mind, uh, I feel, uh, which is the taking this, this, this type of collaboration, but to the executive teams and to, uh, I guess, non-programming environments. Um, do you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. Uh, so as CTOs out there or as VPs of engineering or CPOs, um, what can we bring to our C-suites to sort of encourage that, that level of collaboration? So the, the first thing that I think we need to consider is that uh, the techniques or mechanisms we use to manage things are often merely uh, what we've been taught or shown or as part of the system we're within. So we have to be really cautious. I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. To, to watch out for how much we adopt things that we just haven't given much thought to. And one thing of managing a, a software creation is most people can actually think well for themselves. And we take away that from those individuals when we require that they work in certain ways. We tell them what they'll work on, who they'll work with, when it should be done, the pressure that they're under, and all these things I don't think any of those actually lend themselves to an effective software development environment. So, but bringing this up to other things. So the first thing is just to say, well, maybe let's, let's do a very rudimentary kind of a thing. We've got the work itself that people are going to be doing. And outside of that, we have a system of work. There's an implied system of work until we document it. Now, so we have the work itself, and then we have a system of work. And outside of that, there's another system. That's going to be the system about the purpose or the meaning of this work. And maybe I think there's really another couple layers outside of that. Well, if we go back to the work itself, we can say we can be more efficient or more effective on this work. And that's what the system of work is about. But when we step back from that, are we working on the right things? So no matter what we do, we have the work that we do and the system of work that we've either defined or implicitly are doing. And then what about the purpose of it? And again, it goes out a little bit more than that. Why are we in this business at all? So like that. would that look like, um, I want to get a little tactical here, and I know these are, might be unfinished concepts, but uh, is there a world where in a executive team sync up or a weekly meeting, um, the CEO, CTO, CFO, VP of sales, they're all in the room together, and there's some problem that needs to be solved or there's a challenge regardless of which of those offices and that then as a team collaboration they can all leave sort of their egos out the door and be open to collaborating on ideas uh, for instance if the ceo uh, needs to go meet with a potential huge investor and has two or three uncertainties is there a level of collaboration where you kind of put your you kind of put your role and your CEO-ness you know, aside, and as a human, you just collaborate with five or six other creative beings on what potentially, pridefully could be, well, this is my domain. I'm supposed to be the big cheese on this. But actually, I'm just a human like you, and so you may have creative ideas that I can learn from. Yeah, that's, well, I think that's actually quite brilliant. And this is sort of the crux of working well together, is that... Uh, We've taken these roles because that maybe was an area of interest for us, but it's not a be-all or end-all. And so we have to be really cautious to uh, where do we get the information from that we need? Are we willing to use everybody's ideas? And I would say we have to be cautious not to do that. Yeah. I mean, if we, are, if we are not taking all the value of all the ideas that are in the room, we're probably losing something. Now, who the CTO actually answers to is different in many different companies. In the old days, we could think of our CIO or a CTO maybe was the person who was in charge of things like all the 
the, the electrical, electronic kind of stuff around. We have some phone systems. We have copiers. We have a network maybe uh, when we were getting more into the computer age and so on. So well, who did that person answer to? That was really a cost center. And we were answering to uh, perhaps to a, a, a CFO, CFO or something. Yeah. And so that's a very different look than perhaps what a, an operations officer would have or the CEO would have. So what is the place of CTOs or CIOs or the technology in a company? So if we cannot take advantage of all these different points of view and yeah, actually work yeah. well together, so that means if we're having a meeting, we probably are having to drag ourselves into context we don't have enough Absolutely. time to, to really learn. So we, we go back to what is the area that I'm supposed to be contributing. And so we probably need to figure out are every now and then meetings really reasonable here. What is this team supposed to be doing? And I, and I think uh, um, what I, when I hear about sort of these blended teams doing that style of collaboration, uh, I think of it as sort of human first collaboration as opposed to role first. Yeah. And I think that can work anywhere in the organization, up or down. I mean, not can. At, as a theory, I'm wondering if it, the further up you go, if you can also have the same effect, you know, effectiveness. I would hope so. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, would be, I, would, I think I would find it strange that, that, if it, that it couldn't be. Mm. So what is it? So the work of a software development team is more than writing the software. So the, the work of the software development team spans all kinds of uh, aspects of this solution that we're looking for. It could in the end be, you know what? Software isn't the right solution for this. And if, we ke if we're not open to discovering the right path to go down, um, we're just going to do it. Well, we need some database stuff, so some database team does the database work. And, and, and some back-end team makes it available in some services. And, you know, are we doing the right thing? Yeah, I, I, I almost think that if I, if I take communication and sort of feedback processing, I wonder if a big thing is ownership. Because what gets perpetuated with these sort of siloed, uh, you know, functions is, well, is the imply ownership, right? Well, you own the database modeling. You own the front-end experience. Right. If we start doing away with that and saying, well, we actually all own the product, like you said, or the outcome, or... You know, you just happen to have been classically trained in X and you have experience in Y, so you're the X, Y, but you're bringing that to a collective shared ownership. And yeah. I think with uh, C-suite, to kind of have that same approach where it's like I'm bringing, you know, we all own everything, but, you know, to some degree, but, um, uh, you know, we're not, we're not sort of touting that as, well, you know, you're the... I'm just thinking, is there a world where the CEO and the CFO and the VP of sales also owns the technical stack but, or see themselves as co-owners of that, um, but they looked obviously to the CTO as sort of the representative and the, you know, the, the subject matter expert, but still the collaboration happens sort of on this completely egalitarian sort of level. Yeah. So you, yeah, what you're kind of describing is that the, the pieces – to put together aren't like the pieces in a, in, a, in a jigsaw puzzle. They don't just fit in these exact little spots. You know, there's, there's a great deal more of it, mm. overlap. And so I, I would say this. Uh, I've not yet been to a company where I started talking about we want to we make it where people work well together, where they said, no, no, we don't want people working well together. <laughs> you know, it's like, why did we bring these people together in the first place? is to do something more than an individual themselves can do. But I want to interject something here. I think that a well-run team is going to be really good at getting the best out of each of us. And that means each one of us has to start getting good at helping others grow their ideas. Maybe a big part of that is learning to listen right. Now, not that there's one right way, but Find out what is that way of listening with the, with the focus and intent of helping that other person do their best thinking. It doesn't mean waiting for that space that's just long enough for you to interject your idea. And so we have to be really cautious, I think, in, in, uh, when we bring people together into meetings that we're not really just merely 
uh, following a rigmarole or a, mm. like just some standard practice with the end of which we know that whatever we said isn't going to matter and therefore we're not contributing. You know, maybe we're going along with these ideas of group think where we're just going to take the, you know, we're going to be a yes man because that's the smoothest path or whatever. You know, this whole thing with the uh, study that was had done at uh, Google a couple of years ago or through a couple of years, came out a year ago or so, about the, uh, they call it Project Aristotle, I think it was. They were researching why are some teams better than some other teams? And they've got a lot of teams to research. And what they found a couple things was uh, there's a psychological safety. We can, we can feel safe with this group of people sharing I- our ideas. And another one is equal voice. Not that we all speak an equal amount of time, but that when we do speak, uh, our ideas are equally valued. So why are we on this team? Well, we should be on this team because our ideas are bringing value. And if others don't allow that to happen, or we don't find a good way to allow that to happen at its fullness, we're losing the value of having this team. Now, a lot of people will make decisions uh, at the higher levels uh, based on the hierarchy. And, you know, we've all heard those kind of like to talk about the uh, highest paid person in the room and things like that. These are the things that probably are harming us more than helping us. Uh, how are we going to move past that? Mm. Can we insert a stunned silence um, sound effect? <laughs> Willie, that was awesome. That we're was, just barely getting started. I know, I know. I need to talk to you all day. Uh, well, thank I you. It. Thank you for joining us. I know you are always open uh, to doing workshops. Um, we'll definitely promote and sort of your contact information. Uh, We've done several workshops with you as CTOs at Seven CTOs, and it's been, you know, paradigm shifting. So uh, thank you for being here, and I will see you soon. Well, I had a great time. I always love talking with you. You bring out the best in me. (laughs) So you're not just a good listener. You're above and beyond. I appreciate that. I can record that clip, and I'll... Yeah, yeah, you you can use that to... I think my wife... wife (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7 CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.